it's very important not to give up and it's so easy to give up and there's so many moments in whole my career actually that I would have been justified to give up because the things all the odds were against me but it's those times if you then don't give up you'll get to the next stage and it's very important to just buy through it and just you know weather it through and you'll get at the next step. Welcome to the She Clicks Women in Photography podcast. I'm Angela Nicholson, and I'm the founder of She Clicks, which is a community for female photographers. In these podcasts, I talk with women in the photographic industry to hear about their experiences, what drives them, and how they got to where they are now. This episode features Christy Goodwin, a music photographer and visual storyteller with a passion for capturing the essence of live performance. Hello, Christy. Thank you so much for joining me today on this podcast. Thank you for having me. Now, quite a few female photographers that I've spoken to recently have said that they've come to photography as a second career, but I get the impression that's not the case for you and it was always your first choice. Is that right? Um, that's right, yeah. The, it, funny enough, um, there was never any other options for me. It was always since I was a very young kid, it was photography and once I got at that stage that I had to make a choice what to study, Nobody even questioned it, and I didn't question it. I didn't look at other options. It was always photography from the start. So you picked up a camera as quite an early at an early age. Well, yeah, um, my dad. My dad was a captain at sea, and uh, I often went on um, uh, trips with him. And he had a camera. Um, it was basically a very nice analog back in the day a very nice analog camera that they used if there was some incident on board. So I was always told not to touch the camera, which was very exciting, of course, because, you know, as a kid, when you're told not to touch, that's the first thing you want to do. Oh, yes. And when I... So I ran off with the camera, of course. And um, what I really enjoyed, because my life was quite chaotic, was that I could actually condense the world into a frame which I found very exciting mm-hmm. and so I always kept running off always being told off um, and then first I just looked through the camera it was just the experience to frame things into it and look to it but then I started pressing and what I didn't at that time because I was very young didn't realize that something went on that film and that he would later develop the film and then discover that I had been taking you know, God knows what. So in the end, when I was um, for my 14th birthday, he bought me my own uh, analog camera set. You're not touching mine anymore. You get your own. And from that day on, um, other girls wore uh, a handbag and I wore my camera. And it was just me and my camera. Oh, fantastic. And I think, you know, when you start out with film photography, I mean, for what you're saying about, you know, not daring to press the shutter button, you have a reverence for it, don't you? Because you've got maybe 24 or 36 images and it costs money. So, you know, you're really, really careful. And, you know, when people used to talk about talk about bracketing, yeah. it was a financial consideration whether you bracketed your images or not mm-hmm. to get the exposure right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, very true. But it gives you a good grounding in photography, doesn't it? Yeah. And if you look at my whole career, I shot analog longer than digital. Um, so for some reason, I still think analog when I'm shooting, which I think works in my advantage. Well, I hope Well, I'm this- telling myself it still works in my advantage, but I still think very much analog. And sometimes I hear photographers next to me and it goes like, and I think like you're filming, you're not taking pictures. I still think when I press the shutter, I still see, yes, this is worth pressing the shutter. Because that's how I've always thought. While in people with digital, often don't think they just snap. <laughs> um, I still process what I, when I press my finger. I don't know if it's better or worse. It's just the way I work. Yeah. Have you shot any film recently? Um, no, no. It's just um, I do have a few film cameras, um, and I could do, but in what I do for a living. It's not possible because they want everything immediately. It has to be digital. And in my free time, I just use my iPhone. Yeah, as we all do. So it sounds like you actually studied photography. Did you do it at school and then follow up at university or college? 
Um, yes, I did. Um, so I, there were two, because at Bakrat that day, I lived in Antwerp and there were two choices. Either I could go the technical uh, way, go to a technical school or take the art way and go to an art school. I chose the art school, which my parents didn't quite like because back in the day, art was considered um, lazy people who never get anywhere. But I still, I was, I was scared of the technical. I thought I don't have a technical brain. That's not going to work for me. I thought art is safer. Um, it proved to be much more difficult. But mm -hmm. yeah, well, um, so I did four years of photography there. Um, graduated and then basically immediately fell into a job uh, because at that art school they also have a fashion department and one of the guys who had um, I think it was two or three years before me that he graduated they always come back and then look for people to work with so he came back to look for somebody to work with and uh, he hired me on the spot so I immediately fell into a job as a photographer. Mm -hmm. oh, fantastic. Now, it's interesting you say that you shied away from the technical side because a lot of people are worried about the technicalities of photography. Was that ever an issue for you? No. Um, and the funny thing is that uh, to this day, when I get interviews like this and people start asking technical questions, I just freeze. I think like, uh, I d I, you know, I don't have a technical brain. I don't shoot technical. I don't think technical. What I learned uh, in my art uh, department basically was to feel, to sense, like for instance, back in the day people used to use a light meter and we were encouraged not to use a light meter and to actually learn to feel the light. And so when I go outside, I can tell you exactly how to set your camera because I just learned to sense that. So a lot of technicality happens inside here. I don't need the outside tools. Mm -hmm. um, and when I'm shooting, I never, never in a second will think, oh, I have to change my aperture. I have to ch change my speed. I don't do that. That all happens automatically. And it's because of, you know, what I've learned um, back in those days. Not a technical way, but... The, more with senses, I suppose. And it's become ingrained. I suppose, yeah. I, I can't explain it. And sometimes people look at me like, you know, sometimes they ask, what are you shooting on? I'm like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let me check because I don't know. I just do it. Yeah, you're more involved in the moment than the camera settings. Mm -hmm. And why music photography? What drew you to that? Nothing. <laughs> um <laughs> It's actually by accident. Um, so I was first, so first I did fashion. I did that for three years. And then the guy I worked with, um, he got a chance to work in Paris. He wanted to take me with him. But at the time I had a boyfriend and no, I'm not going to Paris. So I stayed. And then I sort of fell into more reportage and editorial photography. Did that for quite some years. Um but did it then more as a second profession because I got married, I had children, so I had a real job. And then on the side, I did all that. And then um, through a friend, um, you know, I, I was always with my camera. So I took some pictures of, he had a cover band and I was taking some pictures of the cover band, send it to him, which I always did. And um, he sent those pictures to the manager of status quo, unbeknownst to me. And then one day I get a phone call. This guy says, um, you know, I'm the manager of status quo. I want to hire you for my band. I'm like, yeah, right. And I put the phone down because I thought somebody was pulling a prank on me. <laughs> um, no, it was actually the manager. And I had to like go back and say, I'm sorry. I was a bit rude, but yeah, I liked the job. Um, and the first time, I, I had no clue whatsoever. I walked into, the only thing I knew was my cameras. All the rest was alien to me. Um, right from the get-go, I was allowed to shoot backstage. I didn't know what that even involved. There's all these people walking around. I'm like, what? 
then I had to shoot the show. Everything was like an explosion in front of me. And I'm like, what? It was, it was like really deepened from the ghetto. <laughs> um, they liked what I did, which was like mind blowing because I had no clue what I had been doing. Still don't have a clue what I do. But anyway, they liked what I did, did and um, they kept hiring me. And then there was a second client, uh, Joe Satriani, um, who hired me. And then I sort of fell into it. And it's been growing from there. And that's what I do now. Mm -hmm. But it's never been like really a choice. Oh, I want to do music. No. It's accident, really accident. So it was basically, you know, word of mouth, people seeing your pictures, you're getting hired by someone, somebody else seeing your pictures, and it just rolled on like that. I think it's also, um, because music photography is a lot of with emotion, a lot of with feeling, you have to feel the music and all that. Um, and maybe it actually really worked for the style I shoot, which I never knew of and it's only being in it that I realized, oh yeah, something I can do. Mm -hmm. And at that time you were shooting film, but were you shooting color or black and white or a mixture? I actually, music has started uh, digital. Uh, before that, um, the fashion, mm -hmm. I shot black and white uh, because that was the requirement. Funnily enough, he liked it uh, movement in his pictures. So I was like, constantly shooting like that, um, very artsy, but it was fun and it was uh, creative and um, yeah, I did that for a while. Then uh, reporta it's actually in the reportage bit that um, at a certain point I was still shooting film, I held on to it with my dear life. And then um, one of the news agencies, uh, Reuters said, we're not accepting anything analog anymore you have to shoot digital and I really didn't like it and so I just to get the job uh, I borrowed somebody else's camera digital camera which I had to then again start from zero to learn how to use that um, but that's how I had to start because the requirement yeah. was there um, the news agencies didn't allow analog anymore it all had to be digital uh, files in the beginning, I still transformed my uh, film into digital. Did that for a while, but that was too much work. Um, so then I jumped back. But I was very late going digital. I really didn't want to. The first status quo gig that you photographed, was that on digital rather than film? Yeah. Again, a borrowed camera for somebody. Um, and that's another thing. If I look back at that now, I used a camera I had never used before in an environment I didn't know at all, not knowing what I was doing, where I was going, what was required. There was no grief, nothing. It's it's a wonder that I even survived that. That's very brave. Yeah. And switching to digital and a borrowed camera, I mean, there's all those controls to learn and going from film to digital, it seemed like there were so many more controls because you, previously, you, you know, shutter speed, aperture, Tungsten film or daylight film, black and white or colour, that was pretty much it. Maybe a filter on the front or something. But suddenly with a digital camera, you've got white balance, you've got file formats, all sorts of extra settings that you never even considered in the menu. I know, I know. So that's, that's very impressive. Yeah, or stupid. <laughs> Please excuse this interruption because I'd like to thank Siwi, Europe's leading photo printing company, for supporting this podcast and making the She Clicks exhibitions at the photography show possible. Siwi has a UK production team based in Warwick and headquarters in Oldenburg, Germany. The company offers an extensive range of high-quality, award-winning photo products, including Siwi photo books, wall art, calendars, prints, and a variety of photo gifts. To learn more about Siwi and to order prints, visit siwi.co.uk or follow the link in the show notes. Let's get back to the episode. And what is it that keeps you photographing music? What do you really enjoy about it? What I enjoy about it is the the thing is that with artists, they are very creative. They are creative beings. I am a creative being. And it sort of, um, it sort of matches. Um, I love shooting the passion that they have. They, they, 
they transform once they walk on stage. I love that transformation. I love the moment the lights go on, the music starts. There is something magical about that. Um, and then it's usually they have an instrument. It's either a guitar, it can be the microphone, be their instrument, um, anything. And you can feel the love that they have for what they do mostly at 99%. Uh, and it's capturing that, it's getting that, it's it's that um, passion basically and creativity because some artists are very creative as well, which is very exciting. So that's probably what attracts me the most. And when you first got started, did you have any female role models? Yes. Um, way back before I even knew that uh, music photography could be a job, um, Linda McCartney, because I've, since I was young, I've always been a fan of Rolling Stone magazine. Back in the day when it was really still a proper magazine, um, they didn't sell them in Belgium. So I would, uh, there was one shop and I would wait in front of the shop uh, when the time was to be, it, to be delivered to get my one copy. Um, and she was in there a lot. Um, and I love because she did a lot of um, these cheeky behind the scenes. Um, there's this one photo that she took that I, I absolutely loved, um, which is, um, what's his name? Mick Jagger, who just after the show with a towel around his neck walks into an elevator. These kind of things, I found that it was not being there and, and Mick Jagger, it, that was not it. It was just capturing that moment that you could see the elation in his face, like it's over, it's done. I love what she could capture. Um, and her whole music photography, I adored and I really admired her. Mm -hmm. Yes, me too. I think she's a, what was a fantastic photographer and somewhat underrated I think you know people made all sorts of assumptions about her because of who she was married to um, but she was actually a great photographer yeah I think if she wouldn't have married uh, Paul her career would have photography career would have been much bigger yeah because the other myth is that she's part of the Eastman dynasty but of course she isn't it, she just happens to have the same name I know I know Anyway, so what would you say were the biggest challenges that you face as a music photographer? Um, it's a lot. Um, the biggest challenges, first of all, being a woman. Um, the, the problem, well, it's not a problem. It's just a fact. Um, photography, for some reason, is a very, because of technicality, I think, is very much assumed to be for male uh, photographers. <laughs> Like when we go to a new client who has never seen me before and I walk in with Patrick, they always assume Patrick is the photographer. It's just built in. People just think like that. Yeah. So also in the pit, you have 99% male photographers. They're bigger. They push you aside. You have to stand your ground. You, you, you know that there's always this little, um, she's only a woman put her aside so that's probably um yeah. although I don't think I've ever been not gotten a job because I'm a woman it's just getting there um the other challenge is probably that um again I think the credibility that I can do what a man can do um Though I don't have the same technical skill set, I can take pictures as good as the next one. Um, that's something that I've always had to sort of prove myself. I think the lack of technical knowledge is a secret that is held by a lot of photographers. You know, they know their specific genre and I think whether they're male or female, um, they somehow get through it. And they, But they have those sort of things. Oh, I don't know how to shoot this. I don't know how to shoot that. Or I don't know what this does. But... It seems to worry female photographers more than the guys. They just are used to just blasting through. Yeah, especially in the beginning uh, when I first started out in music, I had this 
I still have a little bit of an imposter syndrome, but I had that very big there because I would mingle with the other photographers, male, and they would say, oh, I'm shooting on this and this, and I'm shooting that. And then they would be there showing off their big lenses to each other. And I would stand there and I would feel so little, so inadequate. And I would think like, what am I even doing here? I don't, I, I can't match with that. And then I, I would punish myself. And the next day I would look, you know, because uh, they would be shooting agencies so I could see their pictures. And I would all oh, watch their pictures and think like, oh, they're so much better than me. I can't do that. Oh, why I'm doing this? And I would talk myself down constantly. And then another job would come in and I would think like, okay, I can do this. And off I go again. And it's it was like this constant, like putting myself down, up again, down, up again. But now I'm up. I don't let myself be put down again. But it took a journey to get there. So it's just a question of just keeping going. And eventually that belief came through because people keep booking you. Yeah. That's one of the the things I always say to young photographers is it's very important not to give up. And it's so easy to give up. And there's so many moments in whole my career, actually, that I would have been justified to give up. Because the things, all the odds were against me. But it's those times, if you then don't give up, you'll get to the next stage. And it's very important to just buy through it and just, you know, weather it through and you'll get at the next step. Yeah. Because if you stop, that's where the story ends. But if you keep going, it could go anywhere. Yeah. We never hear of all those people who stopped. You only know of the people who kept going. That's very true. How do you approach photographing different genres of photography? Because it's very different photographing someone who's sitting quietly at a piano playing a ballad compared to, say, the lead singer of a thrash metal band. Well, to be honest, there is no difference. The, 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 there is the same passion. It's it's just expressed differently. For me, there is no difference. I When I do a classical uh, shoot or I do, like you say, a trash or punk or whatever... For me, it's all the same. It's just the artist being very creative with the passion he has. And that's what I capture, whether it's silent or where, whether it's explosive. You just go into it the same way. Um, you just have to, the, the, you know, the guy on the piano, which might, might sound very quiet and very classical, that passion is the same that the guy who's trashing his guitar Basically, same passion. It's just expressed differently, but captured the same way. I guess you'll get the lighting onto that pianist, won't you? So you, you get some drama created there as well. Yeah. One issue I've faced when I've photographed uh, music at, um, say, a, at a festival, which is, you know, a big high stage, and it's usually got monitors at the front. I'm only five foot two. So if the musician is somewhere towards the back of the stage sat down, I can probably only see them from the chin up, but if they're at the front with a guitar, standing, looking, you know, at, at the mic near the front of the the stage, I've got a much better chance of, of taking a dramatic shot. Do you do you have those issues as well? Yeah, I call that a nostril shooting. Um, the thing is that first of all, when the stage is very high, I would not go up front because that's the worst <laughs> visual. You always have to think those people, when they're going to look at pictures of themselves, how are they going to feel? So when I shoot um, high stage like that, I will always shoot sideways. So you have a profile, um, which then you can avoid the nostrils. Um, the the thing with the people in the back, it's either you go very far away and you have like a large shot where you have little mini figures in your frame or you just that that's just the nature of the beast um and next time better and you have a lower stage i always think <laughs> yeah but you just the thing very important in music photography is not to fight the conditions and when you first start out that's the first thing you do you the light goes on and there's hardly any light or there's red light and you start fighting it and the conditions are not very good and you start fighting it and you're constantly fighting what you're getting and somewhere 
halfway through I had to give that up and now I don't fight it anymore because if you embrace what you got like I said the high stage the front one is there that's the one you can work with then just focus on that one try to get him as good as possible do you ever then decide to shoot from outside of the pit I mean it's nice having all that clear space where you could you know you haven't got the crowd jostling you or anything but do you ever go somewhere else because you can get that longer view with a long lens perhaps it depends because I I don't shoot press or anything. I just shoot with clients, with the artist who hires me. They often require these shots where you have and the stage and the crowd. So you can actually get the whole sense of what was going on. So usually what I do is I'll start in the pit and then I'll move backwards, get the whole vibe of the venue, wherever it is. Um... Also, of course, on stage, they love their pictures uh, where it's the artist with the crowd in front of them. Um, But yeah, I combine both. It's not just about the act. It's about the whole experience. And they often want uh, to show off the whole experience. Yeah, I can understand that. And when you're shooting, say, an album cover or portrait of a musician away from the live stage... How do you create a rapport and form a connection with them? I mean, they're, they're used to people telling them how great they are and they love their music. How do you form that connection to get something a bit special in the camera? I tend to feel, um, again, feeling. <laughs> uh, I tend to feel they're all different people, of course, and even though they work uh, in the limelight and they're, they should be used to be in front of a camera, there are quite a few who don't like it, who get nervous, who get tense. Um, and then I always try to find something that can take their uh, focus away from it. Uh, sometimes it can be just give them their guitar and they feel their comfort, they're safe again. Um, sometimes it can be like talking, sometimes they mention something and you can just elaborate on that and and ask them to explain something or talk something that gets them out of that whole frame like oh my god I have to now be in front of a camera but it's 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 different everybody is different and you just have to sense it and feel it and not just explode on them and say like okay now we're shooting and you have to do this and that no, I I tend to let it go organically. I let them be themselves and I hope that they can shed off that um, fear of the lens. Yeah, um, when, particularly when you're shooting, say, say for an album cover, there must be quite a lot of pressure there because obviously it's a, a big money industry. How do you deal with um, unhelpful or negative comments or, you know, even when somebody's very um, non-specific in their requirements, you know, they say, oh, like this, but different. How do you deal with that sort of situation? You know, of course, it's 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 my art, it's my photography, but I always think, basically, they are the one who paying the bill. They are the one paying the invoice. So, you know, it's a little bit like whatever. Um, they're the client. They're wanting this or that is what goes because they're the decision makers. Sometimes things are not feasible and I will explain that to them and I will say like, you know, I've had once uh, f- for a shoot like that and they said we were in this uh, gritty hangar in London somewhere and they wanted it to feel like Miami Beach and like <laughs> not possible. Um, yeah. This is not the environment. Um Sometimes you have to explain that to them, even though it looks very obvious, you know, hello, not possible, but this is what we can do. And I'll give them alternatives and I'll try to warm them up to that. (laughs) But when a client comes to me and they say, we want this, 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 I'll try to make it possible because they're the client. They know what they want. And a lot of these artists have a lot of um, creative people around them who have a vision um, who often express the vision of the artist. And I try to work close to them and I listen to them and 
when it's possible, it's possible. When it's not possible, I will tell them. Good advice, I think. Remember who the client is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've come to the section that I'm calling Six from She Clicks. And I've got 10 questions from She Clickers, and I would like you to answer six of them, please. So if you could give me a number from one to 10, I'll ask you the first question. One. Okay. So uh, actually, quite a few people asked a question like this. So have you ever had to overcome strong personal negative feelings towards a subject or a band um, that you've been commissioned to shoot? If yes, how do you approach such a scenario? Yes, of course, I've had that. And um, how do you overcome that? Well, one thing, and I've explained that before, um, I work a lot of with feelings and I have noticed that that sometimes when I don't like somebody, it shows in my pictures. Well, I can see it. There's this, I don't know, there's something in it that just didn't work. Um, but the thing is that I always... And that's what I try to do is if I don't like somebody or them, it's not about music because I don't even listen to it, but if it's more personal, if I don't like a person, I always think they're there because fans want them. And I'm there as the communication tool between that artist and the fans. And that's what I need to do. And I just try to think of those people, although I don't understand why. They're screaming there and they're happy to see that person. But they are. And I have to respect that. And I have to capture that for them. And that's how I try to... The thing also is that you have to take yourself out of it quite often. Um, it's not about you. This photography... I'm just the one pushing the button, but it's not about me. But the artist and the fans. And I'm just bringing them together through pictures. That's my job. I think that's a great approach. That sounds like really good advice. Okay, so uh, could I have another number, please? Seven. Seven, okay. Uh, what kit would you recommend for someone starting out in live music photography? Now, I know you said you're not a, a sort of particularly technically minded, but are there some aspects of a particular camera or type of lens that you would recommend? Well, these days, any camera is a good camera. There's no... Uh, there's no bad cameras anymore so don't if you're starting out don't be fooled to b have to buy the most expensive kit don't do that the most important thing is that when you buy a camera know it inside out it has to be my camera is like my hand I don't even have to think about it that's the place we, uh, where you have to get and I tell that to everybody shoot all day through shoot thousands and thousands of pictures Really get to know your camera. Do all sorts. Shoot in darkness. Shoot in light. Shoot in the bright, brightest sun. Because that's how you... And make a lot of mistakes. Because that's how you learn to know your camera. Now, for shooting music, I would always advise the 2470 lens and then the 7200. Because then you have the whole range from close by to far away. Don't get fooled with all the knickknacks like fish islands and all those things because those are little gadgets and it's nice to shoot with it. But in the end, that's not what brings out the quality. The quality is just taking the picture that's there. So if you have that range of lens, you're fine. You can shoot anything. Yeah. And of course, you don't want to be spending time swapping lenses around all the time. You've got to... A limited amount of time to get the great shots. Okay, so uh, that's two. Would you like another number, please? Number three. Number three. Do you prefer the dynamism of concert environments for photography or the more controlled environments where you have the opportunity to, maybe you're shooting an album cover or something and you've got the opportunity to control the lights and you're in charge of everything? Well, in the ideal world, I would be able to control uh, the lights at the concert. But that's not a fact. No, I prefer anything live, uh, no matter how bad it is um, and sometimes can be. Um, I do not like shooting in a studio in a controlled environment because it just it's it's numbing. It's there's no it's very hard to be creative when you do something like I often have to do when 
uh, a band is on the road and they want some uh, shots, it's usually in the ugliest venue, in the ugliest backstage. But it's organic. You you can. It's creative. It's looking. It's trying to find little fine gems in a mass of ugliness. But that's what I like. I like the challenge of that. Uh, when everything is so predictable, it just stifens my creativity. It's just like, I find it boring. Fair enough. We each have our own thing, don't we? <laughs> okay. So, could I have another number, please? Um, nine. Number nine. Oh, when you work as an official tour photographer, how much time does that take up? Are you there for the whole tour or do you just go for specific gigs? It can be either way. Uh, sometimes I'm hired for the whole tour and sometimes I'm hired but like very large tours like for instance say Katy Perry then I am hired for maybe the four or five first gigs because then I can get enough material which they make the tour programs and all that with um, but then like for instance with Usher I was hired for the whole tour because he basically wants to document everything so it really depends from um, client to client and what need they have. Do you have a preference? I prefer just a few shows, so I really get to know the show and I can really uh, tick all the boxes that I want to tick because the first show you shoot, I'm usually like a headless chicken. It's like thrown at me and like, what's happening? Where where am I going? What's And then the second show, you already know, oh, I might want to get that and that. And you can build that up and like, the fourth or fifth show, you actually know the show and you're singing along with the songs you've known. <laughs> you know those by then as well. Yeah. And then you can really pick and choose your shots. And then I sort of have scratched my itch, you know. I, I got it. I got it. I'm good to go now. And then I like to go. <laughs> and do you get to know, like, you know, often the artist has some sort of signature moves or and also the lighting. They'll do something at a particular point in the song. Do you get to know those? Yeah, basically... The light is a concert on its own. It has a rhythm. There is a musicality to it. And you basically, I, that's why I say I don't listen to the music that comes off the stage. I listen to the music of the lights. And I try to get that sequence in my head like, oh, this is going to go that way. And then once you you got that registered, you can really work with it. You know exactly where to go and what happens and where the shadow will fall and where the light will fall. And you can work with that. Um, so, yeah, that's usually what I do. The thing um, sometimes very difficult is like when there's pyros or all that like very hard light. That really needs a couple of shows for me because it's so hard it's always I always jump I can't help it I know exactly when it's going to happen and then those spirals shoot off and I'm still going like that <laughs> um but those kind of things need a few shows to really get it right because there's such a hard difference between the light on the artist and that very harsh bright light of the pyros yeah no oh, interesting Okay, so your fifth number, please. Ten. Number ten. Oh, what was the first image that you had published? That question is from Liz. Do you remember what it was? Well, good question, Liz, because you caught me. Um, I think it must have been status quo because the funny thing is that of that very first shoot that I no clue what I was doing, they actually used that in a DVD booklet. And if I look back at that now, I think like, what what was I thinking? But I think it must have been status quo. Oh, wow. I find it really amusing that, you know, that's going against all the advice as well. You know, your first published image, you used a, a borrowed camera. So you didn't know it inside out and back to front, but somehow you managed to persevere and, and got a fantastic image that was used in a DVD. <laughs> okay. So uh, could I have your last number, please? Six. Number six. Oh, this is an interesting question. When you're shooting a live event, how much do you plan in advance and how much is reacting to how events unfold on the day? That question is from Caroline. Again, a very good question. And I don't prepare at all. It has sometimes worked against me. But the thing is that for some reason, I don't research the artist 
the band or anything because I don't want to be, you know, there's so much imagery going around. And if I w- was to research the artist, you'll see the pictures and you can't help yourself, but you're going to shoot that way. And I don't want to do that. I want my own voice in it. I want to receive whatever I'm getting my own way, not being, you know, sort of distracted by what I've seen. So I, I usually, well, actually never uh, research what I'm going to shoot. I like to go in there and be basically like a child, be bewildered with what I get. And it's always a gamble because some things can be very difficult to shoot and I'm not aware of it. And I just have to go and just, you know, catch on to it uh, in the moment. I usually don't know the artist either, which has put me in uncomfortable situations that I pass them in a corridor, for instance, and I don't even know it's the artist. These kind of things, of course, Patrick often says, you know, you should look them up, you should do, and I don't, because I just don't want to know. I um, I like to go in blind. I think I'm also a bit of a thrill seeker, so probably that's also an aspect to it. I like the thrill of not knowing and being thrown into the deep end. Yeah, I can identify with that. Well, thank you so much for answering all those questions and for joining me today. If anyone isn't following Christy on Instagram, I'd really urge you to do so because Christy's images are amazing, but also it's the stories that she posts with those images that are really, really interesting to give lots of insight into music photography. Actually, there's a bit of technicality there and also about the experience and just what it feels like to be a music photographer. So I will put the link in the show notes, but it's Christy Goodwin. So thank you very much, Christy. Well, thank you for having me. It was really fun and very good questions. Thank you to the the ones who send them in. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the She Clicks Women in Photography podcast. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Christy as much as I did. You'll find links to her website and social media channels in the show notes. I'll be back with another episode soon, so please subscribe to the show on your favourite podcast platform and tell all your friends and followers about it. You'll also find She Clicks on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube if you search for She Clicks Net. So until next time, enjoy your photography.